نحمد هو نسلي على رسوله الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وجعل لي وزير من أهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متكبلا آمين سم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سورة لقمان This surah was revealed during the stay of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Mecca and they are there are 34 verses in four stanzas and it is the 31st by the order of arrangement the name of the surah is because uh, it is after the name of uh, luqman in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in the surah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned uh, the advice which he gave to his son the time period of the surah was it was revealed in the starting period of the life of makkah and the background and topic of the surah is that uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about the advice given by luqman a man of wisdom to his son Luqman was a renowned historical personality of the Arabs and they considered him knowledgeable and that is why they used to quote his sayings of wisdom also so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoted the advice he gave his son for obviously the best advice which anyone can give is to his own son so Allah quoted the advice to make them realize that the person whose wisdom impressed them and whose intellect they acknowledged also said the same words to his son as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling you to or is inviting you to words so indirectly it was trying to convince the people to give weight it to the invitation of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says الف لام ميم تلك آيات الكتاب الحكيم هدى ورحمة للمحسنين الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم بالآخرة هم يقنون أولئك على حدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون Allah says Alif, Lam, Meen These are the verses of the wise book. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that the verses of the Quran are full of wisdom and hikmat. Quran is being called as Quran al-Hakim a book of wisdom and the verse is full of wisdom now this is very much in similarity to what is the basic topic of the surah because allah is talking about luqman hakim luqman the man of wisdom and his advice so similarly allah is calling the verses of the book also as the verses of wisdom as guidance and mercy for the doers of good so this quran al hakim turns out to be what it becomes for them guidance and rahmatin mercy for all no just for whom who are the doers of good who are muhsinin so we all who want guidance from quran and we are desirous of receiving the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the merciful then we would obviously want to know understand and relate and adopt the traits of the muhsinin so in the next verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining what is the manner of the muhsinin and how the muhsinin behave so the verse number 4 allah says muhsinin are how and what do they do who establish prayer and give zakat and they are of the hair after certain in faith those are on the right guidance from their lord and it is those who are the successful 
So in the next two verses, Allah has explained the traits of the Mohsineen and then also the reward of the Mohsineen. That is, what do they do? Mohsineen do what? They do not just offer their salah, they establish their salah. And how does a Mohsin, a doer of good, does he establish salah is we, we learn that from a tradition in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Man Ahsan, that what is, what is Ahsan? And he told that you offer your salah, you offer your salah in a situation like what? Ta'allam yarahu, that is, you see your rub. And if you cannot do this, do what? Fa'illam tarahu, fa'allam yaraka. That if you cannot achieve this state of affairs and this frame of mind that you are seeing your Lord during your salah, then at least offer your salah as if realizing as if that he is watching over you and he is seeing you. And similarly, spending zakat in the path of Allah, how does a doer of good and how does Muhsin spend zakat is what Allah says in Surah Baqarah. Allah says, Ya ayyul lazina amanu, la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha, qal lazi yuntiku ma lahu riya an nafi, wa la yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhiri. So a muhsin when spends zakat is obviously doing no form of exhibition and demonstration and uh, show off of all the virtuous deeds he is. And uh, they are the, another uh, behavior and manner of the Muslims is that they are sure of the meeting with their muhsin rab. So the reward is what? Success in this life and hereafter. And of the people, he who buys the amusement of speech to mislead others from the way of Allah, why? Without knowledge and who takes it in ridicule, those have an humiliating punishment. So in this verse number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strongly negating and is condemning a behavior. Not only that, Allah is also complaining of a wrong attitude and uh, misconduct by certain people. Allah explains that despite the fact that there is, there has been revealed Quran al-Hakim, despite the fact that there is a book of wisdom with verses full of wisdom, which which turns out to be guidance and a source of mercy and a guidance for success here and hereafter. So despite having such a book available, even then, leaving it aside, people resort to what? People resort to lahwal hadith. People resort to lahwal hadith and the purpose of buying or, or getting involved in this lahwal hadith is to mislead other people from the path of Allah without knowledge. And they take it very, they take it as a ridicule and they do all this in a non-serious attitude. So Allah is, Allah is negating and condemning the behavior of all those who leave aside the Quran al-Hakim and rather opt for the lahwal hadith to misguide people without knowledge. The result of all such activities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned as azabu muhinun, the humiliating punishment. Allah has mentioned the humiliating punishment for people relating and connecting with lahwal hadith. So to save ourselves from this eternal humiliation, we need to refrain from lahwal hadith and indulging in any form of lahwal hadith. So first of all, we need to know and we need to understand what is lahwal hadith. Lahar means in Arabic, it means and it points to everything which is pointless, which is useless, worthless, or non-productive. Hadith means to talk or speech, and it may be we we can understand it may be verbal, it may be uh, it may be written, or it may be in any other form. So lahwal hadith would therefore refer to all silly, all silly, pointless, useless, non-productive conversations. It may be like indulging in such conversations, reading such literatures with false fictions, 
useless, non-productive stories or novels or watching such silly, pointless, non-productive, false stories or um, TV dramas or TV serials or certain movies with all these characteristics or listening to such useless and senseless poetry, music or songs. So all these will be what? This will be any form of lahwal hadith. Remember, lahwal hadith would refer to everything which will absorb the listener completely and make him heedless of everything around him. And uh, actually, as the as the word to word translation of the phrase of lahwal hadith is, it would it is it does not refer to anything which is derogatory, but in custom and in usage, they strictly apply to evil and useless things and vain things like uh, all things like gossiping and nonsensical joking and talking and jesting and legends and tales and singing, merrymaking and all these sorts of things. Now to specifically understand that what lahwal hadith actually meant in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we can, uh, we can uh, relate to the tradition of Ibn Hasham, and he has related to the authority of Ibn Ashaq that uh, when they were the disbelievers of Mecca, they could not stop the message of Prophet for spreading in spite of their best of their efforts. Then there was a person who was known as Nadr bin Haris. He addressed all the people of Quraysh, and he said, that the way you are trying to counteract Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all these steps and all these manners, they will not avail you anything at all. He was like, he said that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been the most truthful and the most trustworthy person among you. And now you come up saying and blaming him and accusing him that he's a sorcerer and he's an enchanter or a poet or a lunatic or a madman. Who will believe you? Who will believe you when you come out of all these accusations? Now, don't the people know that the way the sorcerers talk, don't they know how enchanters are and the way they conduct their businesses? And are the people of Arab, are they unaware of poetry and the states of madnesses? So which of these acquisitions would stick to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by exploiting which you are trying to turn people away from? And then he told them all, addressed them all and told them that, look, you all just stay away from it and I will deal with the whole affair myself. And then he was a wealthy man. So he left Mecca and he went to Iraq. And from there, he managed to get the legends, the legends and the tales about the people of Iran and Rustam and Nasfandiyar. And he started to arrange tale-telling parties. He would hire he would hire and he would give very high wages to people who were fiery orators and who could explain and narrate the stories very effectively in a very catching manner. And you know what he used to do is that he used to appoint all these fiery orators whom he had taught all these legends on uh, the crossings of the roads or on the ends of the streets or at the turnings of the streets on the way on all the route which he used to take to Dari Arkham. And the purpose was to entrap and to catch and to divert all the people who were converts to Islam to go to Dari Arkham where Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to teach about the messages of Quran and the verses of Quran. He used to teach and narrate them. So he used to appoint people in the route to distract and divert people and to disturb them and to involve, get them involved in these tales. Because, you know, the people of Mecca, they were not literate and they really did not know a lot of tales and fables and all these legends. So when they were explained and narrated in such a catchy manner, they would definitely distract them and they would, uh, they would attract their attention and they would stop there. And you know what these orators were instructed to do and what they actually came up with? that they used to narrate the whole event in a very effective and a catchy manner. And then they used to take the story to a hype, to a climax. And then they used to leave it there, telling them that they will continue the story the next day, similar to what 
all these drama serials are doing today. So, and the next uh, trick which he was trying to distract and divert people from reaching uh, Dari Arkham and getting to know more about Islam was that uh, we learn from the traditions by Ibn Abbas عنه, that Nadar bin Haris had bought singing girls. She, uh, he had bought slave girls who knew how to sing and dance. And when he found out or when he heard that someone was uh, coming under Prophet Sallallahu influence, he would, he would gift him. He would gift him this singing girl who was a slave girl. And he used to instruct the slave girl herself, that all that she was needed to do was to sing to him, to dance in front of him, and to and to offer him or present him with wine, so that he just gets absorbed in all of these things and stays distracted from the other side. So this is exactly the same device which even the anti-Muslim and anti-Quran powers and forces of today are also using to keep the people like absorbed in all forms of fun and sports and musical entertainments in the name of culture or in the name of um, in the name of all forms of games, so that they are left with no time and they are left with no uh, sense to attend to the serious problems of life and in their heedlessness they don't even feel what destruction they are being driven to this is all the tactics of all the anti-muslim powers who are working to stop the muslims to connect with quran and to connect with the teachings and learning of quran so when it was asked as we learn from many commentaries and from many traditions that what actually lahwal hadith uh, meant was Hazrat um, Abdullah, Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, Rasiyallahu Taala Anhu, who was a great, uh, who was a great renowned scholar in the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was asked that what does Lahwal Hadith mean in this verse, and he said, he said thrice, he says, by God it means singing, by God it means singing, by God it means singing. So singing, music, all forms of these things are what, according to Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, for Allah huwa, wallahu al-ghina, they means singing and songs and musics. Similarly, Ibn Jarir, Ibn Abi Shaiba, Hakim, they have reported in multiple traditions from scholars like Abdullah bin Abbas, Jabir bin Abdullah, Mujahid, Ikrama, Said bin Jubair, and Hassan Basri. They have reported uh, that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it is not lawful, it is not lawful to buy and sell and trade in singing girls, nor is it lawful to take their price. You remember in those days, uh, it was the slave girls who were basically taught the skill or the art of singing and dancing, and then they were imposed on people. But today, it is, we don't have to actually, with the modern means of communication, with all these um, sound recording devices and with all these videos and with all these CDs and cassette players and all sorts of things and musical um, uh, instruments and organs available, we don't actually have to buy or purchase the slave girls, but buying or purchasing of all these other videos and other sources of music will come up and is doomed to the same thing as well. So it is not, it is prohibited and it is unlawful. And yet another tradition from Abu Umama is to the effect to teach music to the slave girls and to trade in them is not lawful and their price is forbidden. And in other words, adds to the word that it is unlawful to eat their price. And similarly, if uh, we learn, if we realize the current state of affairs in these words and words of these ahadiths of Prophet Sallallahu it has been told very clearly in clear cut words that teaching of music and teaching of singing and the skills of music and dancing is what? It is simply prohibited in the teachings of Islam and it is unlawful. But today, to compare the situations of the current society of the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you might have come across conditions in which or, or situations in which there is a one-year-old baby 
and the grandma just comes up and uh, puts music or a song in her mobile and then asks the baby to dance and the baby in full swing starts dancing and the and the grandma and the mother and the father and all all those aunts and uncles around them they they feel happy of the child they are clapping and they are praising and they feel proud and they keep on commenting that how sharp the baby is so from the day one, if we are taking pride in it and we are conveying to the child that listening to the music and dancing on the drum of the be, uh, on the beat of the drum itself is something to be proud of and is something is an indication to be very clueful and sharp, then this is like encouraging, this is like promoting all forms of music and all forms of singing and dancing. And today, in the society of today, we see parents teaching, teaching their children to play music or to sing or to dance. Who are we doing all this to? They are the children of Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were, they are the, they are the children of the Ummah who are looking forward to and who are longing to for the intercession of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of judgment. Who, who were actually needed to pray, play the role when they get adults, they were supposed to be the mujahideen of Islam, the preachers and teachers of Quran. And we are handing them over the guitars and we are, we are trying to teach them the skill of music, playing music and musical instruments and sing and dance around in their life. Where are we heading on to? And where will this all lead to? And then I would like end, want to end this whole debate by quoting the words from Qadi Ibn, al, uh, Ibn al, uh, Abu Bakr Ibn al Arabi, who has related an Ahkamul Quran a hadith from Hazrat, uh, Hazrat Abdullah bin Mubarak and Imam Malik on the authority of Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala, and who's saying that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that he who hears, he who hears the song of a singing girl in a musical concert will have molten lead poured into his ears on the day of judgment. So this is, this is what has to be remembered. But we realize, little do we realize, and despite all this, and all the clear cut words of Prophet Wasallam, people tend to disregard this and people still tend to disagree with the prohibition and with the, uh, with the music and dancing and singing being unlawful in Islam and uh, saying that the word haram is not mentioned in Quran. The word haram is not mentioned in Quran, so it is not unlawful to listen to the music. And then they come up giving reasons of occasions in the life of Prophet Wasallam, like on the day of Eid, when Prophet Wasallam arrived and uh, he was there in the in the compart and apartment of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And there were young, small young girls who were playing a tambourine and a duff. And they were singing. And first they were singing the tales and the stories, the, the narrations, the poems narrating the bravery and the gallant uh, uh, behavior of their ancestors. But uh, when Prophet arrived, they stopped all that and they started saying that now we have a prophet who tells us what will happen tomorrow. And Prophet asked them not to recite this while they were singing, but to recite what they were singing previously. And they make this as a justification for the permission of singing. You know, actually what were they singing and who was singing and what, what was the musical instrument which was being used? They were young girls. They were young girls. They were not adults. They were young girls and they were singing legends and stories about the bravery of their, of their ancestors. And then moreover, when uh, they were using the tambourine, because we know as far as the musical instruments are concerned in the teachings of Islam, only all those musical instruments which are open from one side and we just have one side closed, like the, uh, like the tambourine, which has a membrane on one side, but the other side is open. 
only such musical instruments are allowed. Whereas all those musical instruments, which are, we just have one opening and they are enclosed on other signs. And when they are played, they give, uh, they give an echo and they give a resonant note. So because of that resonant and echoing note, the musical instruments, they are not uh, they are not considered lawful in Islam, and that form of music is not permissible to be heard or to be played also. So, and moreover, in all the songs and all the musical concerts of today, the poetry, which we've already talked about previously, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not, he did not like, he did not approve of poetry generally, and he did not quote any, any uh, of these poetical verses while he was conversing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has said in Quran, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَمَّغِي لَهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not teach him any form of poetry. And it was not like him also. And Prophet sallallahu has also warned all of us. And he said that your, your gut or your stomach may get full or your bellies may get full of pus or infected fluid or pus, it would be much better than that if you fill them up with verses of poetry. But then obviously all the forms of poetry which was teaching some form of wisdom that he approved of. And then there were companions who used to write poetry and recite the poetic verses and Prophet Salaam who used to encourage them. But the songs of today and the musical lyrics of today, they are all based basically on the love of this world, on romance, on vulgarity, on uh, all behaviors leading to immoral, immodest behaviors. So this is all what? This is definitely unlawful and this is not permissible in Islam. And then Allah continues talking about it and says, when our verses are recited to him, he turns away arrogantly as if he had not heard them and as if there was in his ears deafness. So give him tidings of a painful punishment. Indeed, those who believe and do write these deeds for them are the gardens of pleasure, wherein they abide eternally. It is the promise of Allah, which is true, and he is the exalted in might and wise. He created the heavens without pillars that you see and has cast into the earth firmly set mountains, lest it should shift with you and dispersed therein from every creature. And we sent down rain from the sky and made grow therein plants of every noble kind. This is the creation of Allah. So show me what those other than him have created Rather, rather the wrongdoers are in a clear error. And we had certainly given Luqman wisdom and said, be grateful to Allah. And whoever is grateful is grateful for the benefit of himself. And whoever denies his favors, then indeed Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. And mention when Luqman said to his son while he was instructing him, what did he say? Oh, my son, do not associate anything with Allah. So the first right on the bondsman of the creator is to have faith and believe in the oneness of Allah. Indeed, association with him is a great injustice. And we have enjoined upon man care for his parents. His mother carried him, increasing her in weakness upon weakness, and his weaning is in two years. So do what? Be grateful to me and to your parents, and to me is the final destination. So here in these verses, we learn what the advice of the wise father was to the son. The first and the foremost right he explained was the right of Allah and the bondsman, that is belief in the oneness of Allah. And then after the rights of Allah immediately comes in the rights of all those around us is the right of the parents, not once in Quran. Surah Baqarah, Surah Al-An'am, Surah Nisa, Surah Bani Israel, and now we come across the same order of preference and priority in Surah Luqman also. So the first right after Allah, the right of parents, 
And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining what the right of mother is over the children. And Allah is explaining here why the right of mother is three times more than the right of the father. As Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also asked, and he was asked, Mana haqqun nasa bi husnin. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who out of the people is deserving of my goodness? He said, Ummuka, your mother. Then was asked, Summaman. Then whom? He said, Ummuka, your mother. Then again was asked, Summaman. Then whom? And he said, Ummuka. And then when he was asked, next who? He said, Abika, your father. So the verse explains three reasons for the three greater rights of the mother, that is pregnancy, the labor, and the lactation. All the difficult hardships and the, and the difficulties which the mother bears patiently during all these three phases is why the right of the mother is three times the right of the father. And then the next, what he advised his son is, but if they endeavor to you to make associates with me, that of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them, whom the parents, but accompany them in this world with appropriate kindness and follow the way of those who turn back to me and follow the way of those who turn back to me in repentance, then to me will be your return. And I will inform you about what you used to do. And Luqman said, oh, my son, indeed, if wrong should be the weight of a mustard seed should be within a rock or anywhere in the heavens or in the earth, Allah will bring it forth. Indeed, Allah is subtle and acquainted. So what was Luqman doing? He was he first asked him to have faith in the oneness of Allah and then to be dutiful and good and kind and merciful to the parents and especially to the mother, giving her three times more right. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes is he introducing to his son. <coughs> and do not turn your cheek in contempt, in contempt towards people and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Indeed, Allah does not like whom Mankana Muhtalan Fahura does not like everyone self deluded and boastful and be moderate in your pace and lure your voice. Indeed, the most disagreeable of sounds is the voice of a donkey. So he asked him to have faith in oneness of Allah and to be nice and kind and merciful to the parents, to establish zakat and to enjoin what is good and to stop from what is wrong and sinful, to be patient, to be steadfast, to refrain from arrogance, boasting, to adopt moderation in his life and to be soft-spoken and polite. So these are the basic instructions which the father gave to the child. Do you not see that Allah has made subject to you whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth and amply bestowed upon you his favors, both apparent and unapparent, both but of the people, is he who disputes about Allah without knowledge or guidance or an enlightening book from him. And when it is said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, they say, rather, we will follow that upon which we found our fathers, even if shaitan was inviting them to the punishments of the blaze. And whoever submits his face to Allah, while he is a doer of good, then he has grasped the most trustworthy handhold. And to Allah will be the outcome of all the matters. And whoever has disbelieved, let not his disbelief grieve you. To us is their return. And we will inform them of what they did. Indeed, Allah is knowing of that within the breasts. We grant them enjoyment for a little. Then we will force them to a massive punishment. And if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would surely say Allah. Say, all praise is due to Allah, but most of them do not know. To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Indeed, Allah is the free of need, the praise worthy. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And if whatever trees upon the earth were pens and the sea was ink, 
replenished thereafter by seven more seas, the words of Allah would not be exhausted. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about what? Kalimatullah. This refers to what? It refers to the word, words of Allah. Words of Allah regarding his power and authority related to his control and creation about his wisdom and mercy, about the attributes of his forgiveness and protection regarding his bounties and blessings. And moreover, the most of all, all the, all the words regarding his do's and don'ts, the permissible and the unlawful and lawful, all the words of Allah. Your creation and your resurrection will not be but as that of a single soul. Indeed, Allah is hearing and seeing. Do you not see that Allah causes the night to enter the day and causes the day to enter the night and has subjected the sun and the moon, each running its course for a specified term and that Allah with whatever you do is acquainted that is because Allah is the truth and that what they call upon other than him is falsehood and because Allah is most high, the grand. Do you not see that ship sail through the sea by the favor of Allah that he may show you of his signs? Indeed, in that are the signs for every patient and grateful. And when waves come over them like canopies, they supplicate to Allah, sincere to him in religion. But when he delivers them to the land, there are some of them who are, who are moderate in faith. Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. And none reject our signs except everyone treacherous and ungrateful. Allahumma ja'alni saburam wa ja'alli shakura. O mankind, fear your Lord and fear a day when no father will avail his son, nor will a son avail his father at all. Indeed, the promise of Allah is truth. So let not the worldly life delude you and be not deceived about Allah by the deceiver. The deceiver is who? The shaitan. Indeed, Allah alone has knowledge of the hour and sends down the rain and knows what is in the wombs and no soul perceives what it will earn tomorrow and no soul perceives in what land it will die. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. This verse number 34 is telling us of the five keys of unknown. There are, with Allah, there are four keys to the unknown, to the unseen, to the future, and nobody knows them other than Allah. These five keys to the future and to the unseen and the unknown are what? The knowledge of the day of judgment, all the issues regarding rain, happenings of tomorrow, Fourth is the conditions in the womb. And fifth is matters related to death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alimul ghaib. He is alamul ghayub. And just he knows all about the unseen. He knows about the future. Trying to find out about the unseen and about future is a major polytheism in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Prophet wasalam, has warned all of us that the person who goes to any anyone who tries to tell them about the future, like a future teller who looks at the uh, at the is uh, is working through palm mystery or through the sun signs or to the horoscopes or the astrology or anything whatsoever, the future teller and the person tends to confirm what he says and agrees to what he says. Then Prophet Sallallahu said. He has disbelieved in all what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has brought. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also warned that any person who is up to all these activities, that he goes to the future teller and he agrees and accepts what he says and believes in what he says, then his salah for 40 days will not be accepted. But now here I would want to elaborate about one thing. What about carrying out like 
ultrasounds for detection and monitoring of the fetal being. Because here, Mafati Hulgai, one of the things is conditions in the womb. And there are people who are uh, extremist enough to say and to label that doing ultrasounds or carrying out Doppler studies for detection and monitoring of the in utero conditions of the fetus is not permissible in Islam and it is unlawful because this is what? This is, this is a major polytheism trying to find out about the unseen because this is not so. The first reason being so is that first, when we use the ultrasound machine or we use the Doppler machines, we can see the condition of the fetus, the fluid, the uterus, the membranes, everything clear cut on the screen. And this thus is no longer an unseen. Moreover, even with the best of ultrasonologists and the best of the Doppler scans, all we can say about is the physical features. We still cannot predict precisely and we cannot predict accurately when and how what changes will occur? What will be the stay? What will be the rate of growth? How will the fluid increase or decrease? What weight will the baby gain or lose? Until when will the mother deliver or not? We still, despite all the best of the ultrasonic studies and the best of ultrasonologists, we cannot predict all that. So, what is unseen? still remains unseen. And what we are doing is actually just monitoring the fetal well-being and to catch some abnormality and to catch some such a thing which might be like hazardous for the baby or for the mother to treat the things or treat the conditions well in time to save of any emergency or to save of any major fetal or maternal loss. And uh, because the thing still, what is unseen and unknown for the future still remains unseen also. And similar is also the case about the weather forecast of today by all the meteorological departments. They are using their scientific uh, technology of today and um, it makes them actually see what is the concentration of humidity and what is the percentage of the cloud and the nature of the cloud. So they can just like meteorologically, they can just predict when will it rain and when will it be sunny. But that is all how much rain and how much of downpour of the rainfall and how much water will come down on the earth and where will the water go and how long will it keep on uh, raining, that is still unseen and that cannot be predicted even with the best of the meteorological departments. So we are not actually interfering or we are not actually finding partners in the attribute of Allah whatsoever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all, guide us all, protect us all, and help us establish salah, help us stay humble and take all forms of arrogance out of our hearts. Rabbana la tuzi' qulubana ba'da is hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antul wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaqbiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين